It should go without saying that the capitalist economic system has made every human on the planet materially better off than ever before in human history. It could take more than an entire video series to catalog each and every way that humans have progressed since the rise of capitalism when it comes to education, medicine, and even more basic necessities like food and water. It's an unfortunate reality of the current political scene that this fact is constantly rejected, especially at a time when serious discussions are becoming necessary. Challenging that capitalism has delivered us nearest to universal human prosperity is to lose focus. That does not mean to say that capitalism is the only ingredient in a fulfilled society. New challenges have arisen because of that same prosperity it produces in abundance. One thing we all understand is that happiness isn't just how many shows you can watch on multiple flat screen TVs or how many digits are in your country's GDP, but rather the social connections we forge, our own sense of importance within a community, and some feeling of purpose during times so rapidly changing. The two largest conservative commentators had one of the more useful conversations surrounding the rapid social change we're seeing. Taken together, they represent a rising awareness within the American people. One skeptical of the rapid changes in our society, versus a more hands-off embrace of the breakneck speed of free market innovation. Tucker Carlson's primary mission is to diagnose what's causing the decline of the basic building block of any community, family. What I care about is living in a country where you know, decent people can live happy lives, actually. And so, no, I would say, no, are you joking? And I maybe would make up some pretext for public consumption, like, oh, they're dangerous. The technology is not quite finessed. No, no. But the truth would be, I don't want to put 10 million men out of work so this, because you're going to have 10 million dead families and the cascading effect from that will wreck your country. But firstly, it's important to understand the way our society has changed in the past century. It's evolved to favor the cognitively gifted who develop the complex systems that make basic necessities affordable. Tracking with the past decades of rapid innovation, a significant segment of the population are rendered intellectually incapable of meeting the demands of these new industries. Throughout history, being especially intelligent didn't grant you special privileges. Mostly everyone had the ability to support families working in a factory line, farming, or performing manual labor. Today, the rapidly expanding tech sectors of the economy require people to wrestle with complex systems, whether it be cognitively demanding ones like programming and mathematically intensive ones like accounting. Shapiro's defenses of the capitalist system as it is echoes the arguments made by Steven Pinker in his books The Better Angels of Our Nature and Enlightenment Now. The, the real question is, you, you mentioned the suicide rate. It seems to me that your explanation of a lot of the social discontent in the United States is economically based. Yes. And for me, I think that a lot of that social discontent is less economically based than spiritually based. But because we are more related. prosperous. I'm, I'm doubtful, actually. And the reason that I'm doubtful is because we are, as a society, more prosperous than any society in the history of humanity, including the people at the lower end of the spectrum. Pinker himself relies heavily on the data from Human Progress, which documents all of the massive gains made in astoundingly short periods of time, such as reducing global extreme poverty to just 10%, not to mention the precipitous decline of violence, both at home and in war. Those are real gains, and not ones to be made light of. If we narrow our focus to the West, we understand that even most of those who are below the poverty line have luxuries that few members of royalty had just a century ago. But someone like Tucker argues that's a less important metric. The primary goal, he argues, should not be economic growth, but the protection of community. The preservation of our communities is the largest challenge we face today. A primary threat to that stability is the focus of one debate between he and Shapiro surrounding wide-scale automation of the driving industry, which threatens to displace the 4.4 million, mostly men, whose income depend upon that or who would support families through those jobs. Noting that it is the largest source of employment in the country for high school-educated men, Carlson worries about what that would mean for them and their families if it were suddenly to be phased out in the coming decades. Shapiro counters with the fact that there are over 7 million jobs ready to be filled, the highest in 20 years, but glosses over a reality that a significant proportion of these have a high intelligence barrier. Obviously, jobs are lost in industries through creative destruction and have been for the entire time the free market has existed. Right? I mean, wheelwrights lost their jobs when, when the automobile was, was right. created. What's to prevent this principle that you're speaking up from just becoming Ludditism? He relies on the common response to these concerns by reminding us that this has been a universal historical response. The argument goes that whenever there's a massive technological innovation on the horizon, the instinct of people is to find a reason to halt it in order to protect their industry, which is fair in the context of horses, buggies, and cars. But the challenge of as-of-yet unseen opportunity doesn't exist in the same landscape. 
One can imagine more jobs would open up that maintain and build on the systems of automated cars, but that baseline of skill is beyond what truck drivers could be retrained to do. This is because our rate of growth is totally incomparable to what we saw before the 21st century. Ray Kurzweil, the leading figure in Google's machine learning sector, writes, An analysis of the history of technology shows that technological change is exponential, contrary to the common sense intuitive linear view. So we won't experience 100 years of progress in the 21st century. It will be more like 20,000 years of progress at today's rate. Although exponential trends did exist a thousand years ago, they were at the very early stage where an exponential trend is so flat that it looks like no trend at all. So their lack of expectations was largely fulfilled. Today, in accordance with the common wisdom, everyone expects continuous technological progress and the social repercussions that follow. But the future will be far more surprising than most observers realize. Few have truly internalized the implications of the fact that the rate of change itself is accelerating. The fact that this will affect mostly men is more important than they may seem. Young men, especially who see no way up for what they see as unfair reasons, are the ones who drive revolutions, who seek to replace the entire system with something, anything new. This is at worst. At best, they check out of society altogether and turn to destructive means of escapism. This is where we now find ourselves. It may be easy to view the same victims of this growth who voted for the likes of Ocasio-Cortez and Donald Trump as losers threatened by change, as many do. They're threatened by economic progress, but they aren't losers for a lack of will. They're so-called losers because they were born into a system that no longer values the abilities they actually have, and in response, they turn to those who offer them an alternate system that will give them the security they now lack, no matter how misguided. Take, for example, Kevin D. Williamson of National Review, who makes a few core acknowledgments. The life expectancies among non-college educated white Americans have been plummeting in an almost unprecedented fashion, a trend not seen on such a large scale since the collapse of the Soviet Union and the social anarchy that prevailed in Russia afterward. Trump counties had proportionally fewer people with college degrees. Trump counties had fewer people working, and the white people in Trump counties were likely to die younger. The causes of death were increased rates of disease and ill health, increased drug overdose and abuse, and suicide. In numbers astonishingly and previously unseen, people are choosing to stop engaging with the system altogether. If they find the answer in demagogues, the onus is on us to answer the question of why they are doing so, and it can't be with mockery or scorn. Those final two are supplied by the same writer. The truth about these dysfunctional, downscale communities is that they deserve to die. Economically, they are negative assets. Morally, they are indefensible. Forget all your cheap, theatrical Bruce Springsteen crap. Forget your sanctimony about struggling Rust Belt factory towns and your conspiracy theories about the Oriental stealing our jobs. The white American underclass is enthralled to a vicious, selfish culture whose main products are misery and used heroin needles. Donald Trump's speeches make them feel good. So does OxyContin. What they need isn't analgesics, literal or political. They need real opportunity, which means that they need real change, which means that they need a U-Haul. It's of course true that addiction to opioids and welfare are rampant in Trump country. It's also likely true that it's for those reasons that when Trump promises him things he can't deliver, they are mobilized to support him. But what Williamson bluntly states, and what Shapiro implicitly believes, misses the point. At what point in our national progression did middle America stop gathering at their community's churches in favor of popping pills? It wasn't sheer selfishness, as Kevin D. Williamson claims, even if that's part of the story, as it almost always is. It's much simpler to cite selfishness or laziness than for intellectuals to concede the reality that some people don't have the mental ability to become physicians, pharmacists, or software engineers. This fact is considered radioactive by mainstream culture only because of how harsh it is. This inability understandably prompts many to look for an easy fix in the form of a government willing to hold back the tide of rapid change. Tucker Carlson identifies what causes this appeal of populists as different as Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. The people who feel resentment, since they still have the vote, their labor is worth nothing, okay? That's why labor unions have collapsed. The value of labor has declined over the past 100 years dramatically, but they still have the franchise. They still have political power. And what are they going to do with that power? They're going to punish you. But is it isn't the with way populism, to... and that Trump is the beginning of that. So we just said... elected Donald Trump president, right? As if you needed a clearer indication that there is profound, not just dissatisfaction but unrest. You would not elect Donald Trump president unless you were enraged and desperate. And so we do not take this seriously. That's that's the point. Without an external existential threat. 
coupled with an increasingly preachy elitist class. The white swaths of Americans who no longer believe in the system are given voice by populists. The effects of these populist proposed solutions, whether positive or disastrous, is irrelevant to this group of people. Shapiro puts forth in this discussion that the rejection of Judeo-Christian faith has caused a decline in community, but the question arises of what caused the death of God. A number of possibilities come to mind. He argues in his written response to Tucker's Fox monologue that America's spiritual, physical, and mental deterioration can be laid at the feet of individual decisions made by individual human beings, by cultural forces militating against religious virtue and in favor of radical redefinition of human relationships, and by governmental intervention that has skewed incentives. On its face, this might make sense, but it isn't as though cultural forces sprout from the ether and spread by sheer word of mouth. As argued before, it isn't hard to see how skewed incentives have come courtesy not just from government, even if that's true as well, but also from market forces. This could be by way of pornography, which has all the conveniences of sexual gratification and none of the effort, and media conglomerates broadcasting that cultural assault into every American home. Not to mention the sexual liberation that has so recently reshaped the culture because of birth control and the automobile, which were only made possible through capitalist innovation. It's a very atomized, libertarian viewpoint that skewed incentives can only come from government bureaucracies. After all, if it is merely government that can be blamed for these crushing consequences, it would only be a matter of electing new leaders, undoing harmful policies, and deconstructing the administrative state. If spontaneous human behavior is to blame, that's obviously a much trickier matter. No man is an island unto himself, nor are his choices, regardless of how much we'd like that to be true. He continues writing, Market capitalism has not destroyed our social fabric. Lack of values did that. If market capitalism exacerbated that problem through materialism and consumerism, that's because we chose to make it so. Shapiro's thinking here is far too simplistic. In a strictly literal sense, we chose to make it so. Yes, he thinks that these nefarious cultural forces are what's preventing people from seeing the benefits of religion. But that doesn't change the fact that seeing something and having the incentives to embrace it are two separate things. With constant temptations bombarding the average person via their pocketed supercomputer, expressly tailored to their unique interests and subconscious profile, the incentive structure has never been so opposed to a religious lifestyle. And that fact has nothing to do with the Frankfurt School infiltrating our schools or media executives meeting the demands of people's most base urges. That too is a choice, but it isn't in the self-interest of the consumer creating the demand in the first place. In the same way that market absolutists miss that prices and market efficiency can't produce meaning, strict atheistic skeptics haven't learned that reason doesn't give meaning either. Both are tools and apparently quite effective ones, but if they aren't tied to a transcendent ideal, it's a tool without a function. Our society's glaring existential crisis has made obvious that so far it's been a self-destructive one for our communities. Neuroscientist and public intellectual Sam Harris, for instance, is carried away by his blind faith in this rationalistic ideal. He misses that not only is there a huge subset of the population for whom reason itself is far too abstract, reason just hasn't offered us a reason to get up in the morning. If you're the rare person for whom reason is itself enough, all the better. But it's a fool's errand to believe that you can impose that on a societal scale, especially a society in which a large minority can't even figure out kiosks. Further, this double standard seems to be lost on Harris, who otherwise understands the subject of IQ very well. If we enter the world that you would suggest, not everyone may necessarily come out as Sam Harris. Well, g give, me, give me one way where you think it can go wrong. And again, this, be, you, we can't forget your caveat, which not, you started what with. Not, what if you're not very smart? Right. Well, 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 no, so I don't mean person. So then obviously. you're basically saying that the stupid people need their myths. You know, uh, we smart people on stage don't need them. He acts as if it's absurd that a Christian religious narrative could be the most effective consolation for people limited by mental disorders or low intelligence. But it's hardly the case that only these kinds of people have benefited from religious belief, given that white-collar workers are not immune to this pandemic of mental unwellness. The data clearly shows that highly religious Americans are happier and more involved with family. They have a strong sense of gratitude which allows them to see past the transient materialism that is mass-marketed to the public. The idea that we can reprogram humans to become cerebral, rational beings mirrors the belief that a few sociologists can re-engineer the biological differences between men and women. It's no coincidence that every society in history has developed a deep religious identity, and the idea that some brand of empiricism concocted by a group of intellectual urbanites is going to uproot that is frankly utopian. 
It's not hard to imagine a future that resembles secular hypermodernized South Korea with its insane levels of technological innovation, fanatical work culture, plummeting birth rates, and runaway suicide epidemic. A report from Reuters paints a bleak picture of the direction we seem to be heading. Once a country where filial duty and a strong Confucian tradition saw parents revered, modern-day South Korea, with a population of 50 million, has grown economically richer, but family ties have fragmented. Nowadays, 1.2 million elderly South Koreans, just over 20% of the elderly population, live and, increasingly, die alone. Yoon's former husband, whom she divorced 40 years ago, relinquished responsibility after being contacted by the hospital and told of her death. Her only son was unreachable, as he had long broken off contact with his parents. Nothing foundationally separates us from South Koreans. In fact, they have an average IQ that is notably higher. What binds the social bonds of Western civilization is the religious foundation its culture and governments were shaped in the image of. One secular, prosperous people are going to face the same crisis that any other have if they abandon those values. Foolishly, the racially obsessed corners of the political sphere believe that ethnic homogeneity is the be-all end-all in a country's societal health. But overwhelmingly, homogenous countries like Japan and South Korea are deeper in this quicksand than we've ever seen. These countries meet the criteria of what fringe ideologues on both the left and right say will usher in utopia. Free healthcare, massive technological innovations, and racial homogeneity, and yet their societies face graver existential crises than we've ever seen. Conservatives like Ben Shapiro are often ready to blame those kind of secular academics and degenerate media producers for the decline of Judeo-Christian faith. But many within this sphere are recognizing this may be a limited analysis. Jonah Goldberg, a prominent conservative columnist, acknowledges as much. Broadly speaking, technology were the things that drove culture as much as anything else. And a lot of conservatives, they just want to have arguments with those ideas yep. without dealing with the things that are changing the way we live. The idea that sexual promiscuity all comes from some, you know, some bad ideas that escaped some German lab is nuts. Or it's, from Kinsey. Um, or it, Hugh Hefner to pick something where I'm, you know, I like the idea of, like, I, I think it's useful to talk about Hefnerism, right? Yeah, and he, he made things work. And he made things happen, yeah. but something like that was going to happen. If you looked at the census data, once you hit a tipping point about the, the mass production of or mass ownership of automobiles, the number of shotgun weddings skyrocketed in this country because teenagers are off having sex in the back of cars, right? And I think that there's a lot more of that to intellectual history than people realize is that these books are produced because of attitudes that already exist. They don't create the attitudes. In an earlier column, he presses further, suggesting capitalism may play a role in this social decay. Capitalism has its limits. It creates wealth, but it's utterly silent about what should be done with that wealth. It provides avenues for accomplishments in certain spheres, but engenders a culture on the left and right that often looks with skepticism or hostility at people who want to measure their accomplishments in terms not easily monetized. Because of its insatiable and ingenious capacity to translate human wants and desires into products, it has the tendency to commercialize things best not commercialized, from sex to Christmas to childhood itself. Removed from that central religious guideline, a whole array of bad actors will always move in to sell tickets to Pleasure Island. Feminists adopting the idea that the altar of money creation is the most valuable thing a woman can strive for is certainly an example of this. Women are demonstrably not happier than they've ever been, despite being overwhelmingly accepted in the workforce. This is not to say that women joining the workforce is necessarily making them unhappy, but it does contradict. 
the carefully packaged lie that it's an ultimate aspiration for lifetime fulfillment. Surprisingly, beyond a certain point, you can only go on so many vacations and sip on so many margaritas. On this note of workforce gender differences, that's what's gotten Tucker Carlson in such hot water, having cited studies that demonstrate the biological truth, women are hypergamous. Across large populations, that is true and it's been shown to be true. So when male wages decline below those of females, marriage formation declines along with it. But childbirth does not. Right. In other words, we're sort of right, hardwired right. to impregnate, okay? That continues. So what the net effect is you have no families and more kids, especially boys, growing up in fatherless homes, which all but guarantees that you repeat the process. So like you have the disintegration of the family because of an economic factor. In rural America, divorce among white people is now the rule. Out of what like births and a lot of zip codes are the majority. It's not, why did that happen? Because the men make less than the women. Nobody wants, then there's so much social science on this. Nobody wants to say it out loud because you're violating some unspoken rule of like unhappy feminism or something. I don't care. It's true. Study after longitudinal study has shown that when men make less, women don't want to marry them. Some guys will probably rush to dismiss this because their wife earns more than they and they're perfectly happy. That's great. It stems from the fact that people are still individuals. But biology isn't defined by fringe exceptions. Before the introduction of women to the workforce, the average man was just competing with other men for money and status. Now he's competing with both men and women. Naturally, that isn't a reason to oppose women in the workforce, but it's an added societal complication that is unprecedented. After all, the number of men women can find desirable shrinks, and men who are either unable or unwilling to attain those positions will grow resentful, bitter, and depressed. Whether they lack the willpower or the cognitive horsepower, the outcome's the same. Will grow depressed is maybe not the most accurate description, considering that process is well underway. Fundamentally, this is caused by the cult of market success overtaking our previous moral foundation. The notion that raw economic gain is what nourishes the human soul rather than something higher, and their mad frenzy to adopt male forms of competition isn't returning the kind of meaning they were told it would by women's studies professors. As men realize how much more difficult it is to be minimally attractive to women, they will have no reason not to check out of the game. It isn't as if they have any shortage of alternative habits to make. Video games are progressing rapidly and transitioning towards virtual reality. Pornography's exaggerated depiction of human sexuality hits all the right neurological buttons immediately. No need to develop a personality or accumulate valuable skills if you have to work beyond your cognitive or industrious limits. Just turn on your computer and go. After all, it isn't as though we have a subconscious that is any different than the one we evolved with. Surely we can't distinguish between the heightened visuals of a pixelated woman and an actual one, but people obviously can't get the same emotional fulfillment from the former. It's a cop-out that the market all too eagerly supplies, free of charge and in boundless abundance. The chief aim of life and the core building block of community, which is building a family, is effectively disincentivized by commercialized visual sex. Without religious conviction, communal belonging, and economic security, the path forward is murky. But it begins with the understanding that neither market worship nor ingratitude for its fruit is the answer. Religion and spirituality undoubtedly will play a role in the solution to this communal crisis. Clearly, that human need is embedded deep within our neurological psychology, if the newfound power of psychedelics is any indication. Its ability to reduce death anxiety and treat addiction being the most urgent examples. Even so, those benefits cannot be sustained without a tight-knit social network. Whatever the case might be, it's an unfortunate reality that the tribalistic elements of our politics are dominating the conversation. Ben Shapiro and Tucker Carlson's discussion marks one of the first major and balanced attempts to refocus the disagreements on what actually matters to the vast majority of Americans.